Good evening, brothers and sisters. I hope everybody can hear me. Amen. It's, it's always a privilege to welcome everybody in this session. And we're so blessed to have our brothers and sisters from all over the Gulf and even far and wide in this uh, beautiful planet of ours. And uh, I believe that uh, no need for prolonged introduction with our speaker for today. And we have learned a lot through the weeks that we have uh, hear him about the teachings and the knowledge that was imparted through all this session. Thank you very much. And uh, tonight, let's be ready with our hearts you know, to gain more knowledge about the Lord and how we conduct ourselves as disciples. So before we give the floor to our brother, Douglas Jacoby, let's all go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you very much, Lord, for this evening, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for just uh, bringing us all together, all the Gulf churches, Lord, that uh, we're able to be together as one family, Lord, to listen and to be enlightened in all the things that we're going to discuss with today. Open all our hearts that we may truly uh, invite the Holy Spirit in our studies for today. We just want to lift you up and glorify you in this uh, night in jesus name i pray amen amen thank you for the encouraging welcome pong i appreciate that and i'm very happy this evening to take us through the fifth talk in this special series the holy spirit christendom and practical living greetings from sunny scotland one of you said that in his country, it reached 46 today. We had our hottest day of the year here, 22. Wow, I did not even have to wear a coat when I went outside. But it's great to be here. It's wonderful to be able to connect with you. Each talk I've done, I've shared for a few minutes at the beginning about some of my ministry. I'll speak for a minute or so about opportunities I have to teach in different institutions. Uh, a university called Lincoln Christian, uh, the Rocky Mountain School of Ministry and Theology, which some of you have been students in, and, um, and one more, which is the Athens Institute of Ministry, uh, which is a program that we've done all over the world. Most recently, it was just launched a few days ago in the Hawaiian Islands. The Athens Institute, and normally this is done over a period of three years, it's only part-time, uh, includes uh, 12 uh, central courses. As you can see, a number of them are really focused on Bible. And that's what I think I have to offer the most, to teach people, give people the training they need for Bible. And this is a typical, this, is a, this was actually one of our certificates. When people finish, and not everybody does, because it takes discipline to spend time in the Word and to push ourselves, especially as we get older and older. One other thing I'll mention, and then we'll uh, begin the class proper, is um, I know some of you have subscribed to my newsletter, though I don't think very many, because we actually have fewer subscribers now than we did a few weeks ago. <laughs> so this is how you do it. This is my website. See, it's my name, first name, last name, uh, dot com. And so that's what the homepage looks like. Then you scroll down to this part of the homepage, and you'll see it says, insights in your inbox and here's that's not a real email address or maybe it is someone who's very lucky and you just simply submit and then when you've done that you'll get a thank you and then you'll see see this uh, in orange or kind of rust color uh, that's your a free book that's my book when god is silent and you get if you just sign up for the free newsletter you get a free book uh, it's a book on the problem of human suffering okay so i hope you'll You'll take advantage of this if you have not already. Well, we spent our first two classes on Holy Spirit. And of course, because this is profoundly, infinitely deep, we could only scratch the surface. Well, in the second section on Christendom, we looked at church history, and then we talked about doctrine. Uh, church history, we we're only scratching the surface. And the truth is, even with doctrine, there's so much to do. 
a couple of the important conclusions were that unsound doctrine, that is unhealthy doctrine, makes us unsound. It makes us unhealthy spiritually. You know, when we say it makes us unsound, at first I think, you know, mentally uh, unsound, but actually I think that's actually correct. Uh, if, if we're not following the right teaching, we look at things incorrectly. We're not balanced as Christ wants us to be. And as he has made very clear, living in him, living in accord with his word and his teaching is more important than just learning or technical theology. I hope you have enjoyed that book, that free book. We leave that behind. And now we're moving on to practical Christian living. Today, I want us to focus on the vertical, that is, our relationship with God. Next week, uh, we'll be looking at the horizontal relationship with others. Now, of course, our relationships with others and with God are connected. For example, in 1 John, it says that you don't really know God. You don't love God if you can't love your brother and sister. So it's a great mistake to imagine that we can be close to God, but not others, or we can be close to others, but not God. It's a little more, uh, they're more connected. There's an organic connection. So today I wanted to share seven things. You can call them seven principles if you want. Uh, we could have had nine or 11, but no, 11 is not a biblical number, is it? <laughs> okay, just ended up being seven. The first three should seem very familiar. Um, practical Christian living, the area of giving, the area of prayer, and the area of fasting. And they should seem familiar not only because we discuss them, but because these come from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, in this very order. There are many scriptures in this evening's talk. I wish I could read all of them, but we'll read some. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Now, he doesn't say that you can't practice your righteousness, that you, know, you can't pray or give in front of other people, because sometimes people know, particularly when we do things corporately as church. But the danger is to be seen by them, where we feel relief, oh good, uh, someone, asked me the question, I got the right answer, or they saw me doing a good thing, reaching out, or, or not eating too much food, or using good words, and okay, I'm in the clear. Because our relationship with God is not just when we're with other people. And Jesus uh, he mentions three different areas. When you give to the needy, that's Matthew 6, 2. When you pray, and when you fast. These are three things he assumes that we'll do. And yes, I know he's speaking to uh, Jews. Technically, it's still the old covenant. But we see in the New Testament, in the new covenant period from Acts 2 on, they're still giving to the needy, they're still fasting, and they're still praying. So he says, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you. See, the danger is you'll lose your reward. So there actually is a reward in heaven. Now, that's an idea that as a young Christian, I resisted because I thought it sounded too much like works righteousness. But I believe that's actually true. There are rewards, even we could say levels of reward in heaven, just as if we don't make it, if we're punished, there, there are levels. When you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, that doesn't mean don't be responsible with your personal finances. Yeah, I don't know where I am. I don't know how much we have, whether we're in the black or in the red. Now, that's not what it is. Um, so your giving may be in secret. The New Testament has quite a bit to say about wealth and possessions, particularly in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But there are other passages as well. But how did they use money? And what I'm going to say right now, well, not be very politically correct. Not everyone will like this. Um, uh, if people are eavesdropping from other ministries, perhaps. But in Galatians 6.10, Paul says that we should, because we reap what we sow, 
um, we, we should do good to all people, but especially to those of the family of faith, the household of believers. And we see that the Christians, historically and in, in the first century, took care of many poor people, but especially the focus was on needy Christians. Matthew 25, Jesus says, whatever you did to the least of these brothers of mine, you did to me. You visited me when I was sick, you gave me drink when I was thirsty, and so forth. And I don't deny that that has a very broad application. But many of the early Christians understood this to refer to the church, the least of these brothers of mine, referring especially to Christians. Christians in prison? Yes, Christians in prison. So in the New Testament, I would say, and, and there, there's no one passage that proves all of this, but it's a sense of weight or emphasis. The biggest stress is on helping needy Christians, helping needy people, starting with insiders, then outsiders. And then a third focus would be missionary support, something that the Apostle Paul received, though sometimes he refused to receive it. And what does this mean? Room and board, a place to stay, something to eat. Think of Elijah uh, on, in that uh, roof level uh, private room, the old couple made for him. Room and board and help with travel expenses, as when Paul wrote to the Romans and said, please help me to go to Spain in Romans 15. Now, I'm not against buildings. I'm not against uh, staff. I'm not against a lot of things. A lot of things can work. But this is how giving is emphasized in the New Testament, those, those three. Secondly, when you pray, he says, don't be like the hypocrites. It's very similar to the giving. Let's, uh, now, we have to be careful how we read the Sermon on the Mount, because there are many passages that, if taken literally, won't make sense. Still, we can understand what he means. For example, look in Matthew 6.6. 6. When you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. Some people have interpreted this to mean that we should not pray with other people. Or we should not pray out of doors or in church, because he says, in your room and shut the door. It's a fair question. When did Jesus go into a room and shut a door? I'm not even sure he really had a room or a door to shut, at least not during his uh, his few years of, of ministry with the apostles. But he says here, shut the door. I know a brother who took this literally, and he moved to another country, and he had a, an apartment, he had a flat, and he actually turned an inner, it was a space, kind of, I guess it was like a wardrobe or a, a, like a closet, and he turned it into a prayer chamber. Is that necessary? Because when did Jesus pray indoors? He seems to be doing it out of doors. <laughs> so if we take it too literally, then we have Jesus not doing the right thing. Surely he's simply illustrating the attitude we should have. And also in verse 7, not heaping up empty phrases. So it's not flowery language or the length of the prayer that's important. He actually says, when you pray, you should pray like this. Now, again, as a young Christian, I believe that we should not say the Lord's Prayer. And why was that? I said it before I was a Christian. Well, because at some point, and this wasn't in my first year as a Christian, but I figured it out, and especially maybe around year three, year four, I was told, well, the kingdom already came, so there's no need to pray this prayer. I didn't understand that God's kingdom comes in waves. It, the future breaking into the present, there's an overlap. Yes, we're in the kingdom, and yet we pray for God to deliver us into the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, 2 Timothy 4.13. We're in the kingdom, Colossians 1, 11, uh, 12. Early Christians, that is, those who lived in the, the decades following the apostles, used this prayer. Is it wrong to say this as a group? It's more of a group prayer than an individual prayer. Did you notice it says our father, not my father? And so this is a prayer that I pray every day and have for many years. So Jesus gives an, as an example, this is not heaping up empty phrases. 
it's not flowery language. It's very basic. And interestingly, not much of what we would call doctrine or even the things that many preachers emphasize. I mean, there's nothing here about uh, giving or evangelism. There's nothing here about coming to midweek. <laughs> uh, and yet, this was the example of prayer Jesus gave us. And so we must think about that carefully. I received a suggestion from a friend dur during the time I was preparing this talk, and something that he finds helpful is to pray for one minute. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying have a one-minute quiet time. He simply, because this, well, I know him, he spends a lot of time in prayer, but just to stop what you're doing occasionally and pray for one minute, he's found at the end of the day, he's, things are just gone a lot better. And as I've tried to follow this, I think I'm experiencing the same. Another suggestion he has for us is to say the Jesus prayer. There are different forms of this prayer, but this is well known around the world, and it, it's, it's uh, really inspired by the prayer of the tax collector in uh, Luke 18. Luke 18, 9 to 14, uh, uh, 9 to 14 we have uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the tax collector who wouldn't even look up to heaven. So the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you may need to say that more than once. So those are just some ideas. And then the third area, of course, is fasting. And Jesus says, it shouldn't be obvious. When I first read the Bible, I wondered why he said in verse 17, that when we fast, we should anoint our head. We should put oil on our head. I didn't know at that time that that was part of daily hygiene. Nor did I know that oil, this is probably olive oil, that that would uh, help you with body lice. It, it kills lice. In other words, something that people would do on any normal day is wash their face, you know, put on some uh, uh, oil. You can think of cosmetics if you want to, or skin, what do you call that? You know, uh, even sometimes I, I use that on my hands. But he says, if, you, if that's the way you normally are, and then you stop taking care of yourself when you're fasting, then everyone will know you're fasting. And no reward for you, and you've missed the entire point. So that's fasting. And I guess the question is, do we fast? In the early church, and we know this from uh, what survived from the second century, many Christians fasted twice a week. In fact, they had two very specific days. The Pharisees, at least according, according to the Jewish records that have come to us, fasted twice a week. Many Christians chose two different days. Now, I don't believe that we can prove uh, exactly what a fast was. And I'm not, I'm not talking about, obviously, they did, not, they did not fast from video games or from chocolates or something like that. Uh, this has to do with food and drink. And I suspect that a fast was no bread, no water. But like those who fast in the Middle East today, who are mainly uh, Muslims, I suspect it was a daylight hours fast. That is that they didn't eat in the day, but in the evening they did. And I'm not so sure that they got up before, <laughs> you know, before sunrise and had a, a meal because that's kind of cheating. And obviously, they lived in a very difficult part of the world also and, and hot. But I suspect that their fast was quite thorough. Uh, but I suspect it was in the daylight hours and not the evening. That's just my idea. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I cannot prove that. In Judaism, there were certain fasts. In fact, even in the Old Testament times, there were a number of fasts every year that people were expected uh, to participate in. And yet the law of Moses, the Torah, technically only gives one day, and that was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is a day of humility, humiliation, really. But how about you and me? Do we fast? I will admit that normally when I fast, it's because I'm working too hard, which is probably another sin. <laughs> you know, I miss a meal because I'm, I'm, I, I lack the grace and the balance that the Lord had, who had more responsibility than I do, and who, uh, who met, who met those demands, who executed those duties 
in a more gracious and beautiful way. At any rate, do we fast? Not just accidentally, but intentionally. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not suggesting we should make a law, um, but it is something we see in the Bible. And we'll continue. Uh, let's look at some more principles uh, that uh, connects us with God, uh, the vertical, that is, in the uh, Christian living. So the fourth one, we're now in the middle of my lesson, reading. Now, why did I put a question mark after the word reading? Some of you uh, know what I'm going to say because we've spent time and we've talked about that. We often say you should, good Christians read their Bible every day. But we have to be careful not to make up rules that are not actually biblical. Is there any command to read scripture? Or maybe another question, and let's just be humane and sensitive to the global uh, human race, is literacy required for salvation? Not everyone can read. So if you're going to say everyone must read, uh, whether you say every day or whenever, you're requiring something that may be beyond what many people are capable of. Now, there are many ways to get the word into our heart. You could have someone else read to you, I suppose. You could also pay closer attention at church or focus more in your own study. You might say, well, Douglas, what about Acts 17? The Bereans, they, they looked at those scriptures every day to assess the truth of Paul's message. Well, I don't think that passage works very well because it's not a command. It's only an example. It doesn't say that they continued to uh, test Paul and to read every day after they became Christians. Now, maybe they did. But the, the point was they were making sure that he was biblical. And, of course, what they were reading was the Old Testament. So it's not a command. It has a specific focus and presumably time, a length of time. And it, it's not the New Testament. You might say, what about Deuteronomy 17? Now, that's the only passage I know that commands daily reading. But it's only expected of the king of Israel. Because he will go off uh, to the right or to the left. He'll go the wrong way, think he's better than other people and he'll become like your typical politician if he doesn't have God's law in his heart every day. And so for the king, it was required for him to have scripture and read it daily. For the rest of us, what are we supposed to do? Uh, well, we're supposed to meditate on God's word. Now, before I go on, I, I don't want to leave the impression that I, that I think that it doesn't really matter whether you read the Bible or not. I imagine most of us listening to this can easily read every day. Some people may have reading difficulties. And as I mentioned, on the planet, you know there are many people who really cannot read, or they can't read much more than their name and a few words. But what we are told to do, and this is a command, is to meditate on God's word. So please, don't think I'm saying don't read. I continue to study. Uh, the Bible is my central focus, though I, I read many other things too, and I think I'll probably keep doing that until I die. Okay? But what about meditation? Meditation is connected with being strong and courageous. The righteous meditate on the Word of God. And Paul encourages us to let the Word live, uh, dwell in us richly. Now, in the Old Testament, this is quite interesting, because in the Hebrew Old Testament, you have the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law, well, that's God's law. And even for us, although we don't have to uh, obey God's Old Testament law, the law of Moses, it's still the word of God for us. We can still learn much. For the Jews, they needed to uh, do it and meditate on it. Joshua 1.8 Joshua is the first book in the middle section of the Old Testament, that is in the Hebrew Old Testament. And this is part of what are called the former prophets. In other words, they looked at Joshua and Judges not just as giving some history, but actually as being deeply prophetic. And I think we should too. 
So just verses, just a few verses into that second section of the Hebrew Bible, what do we have? We have this, this uh, call to meditate. And then the third section of the Hebrew Bible, by, by far the longest uh, uh, piece there is the Psalms, we have in verse 2, again, meditating on God's Word. And you can find other things as well. So, do we meditate on God's Word? And that's really important because we can read, if we're just reading to be seen by men, if we're just reading and it doesn't penetrate, that's useless. It's better just to read a little bit and let it enter our hearts so that then it can dwell in us richly. There are two more practical areas I'd like to bring up, uh, and, and then we'll, uh, I'll, uh, we'll have time for some questions. And this, the sixth area is solitude. And you say, solitude? You mean like just being alone? Well, that's more easily said than done in some parts of the world. In some parts of the world, the population is so high and there's so many people living in one place, it's, it's really hard to get alone. I understand that. Still, this is something we should consider. I recently did a talk on Elijah. I called it the gentle whisper. You remember that Elijah, the prophet, has this great victory on Mount Carmel. Maybe that was the high point of his entire spiritual life. I, don't, I can't prove that, but it seems like it. Maybe it was literally the high point, because Mount Carmel, you're up there. But he hears that there's pushback. He hears that Jezebel, that's a foreign, that's a Phoenician or Lebanese, we would say, wife of King Ahab. And Jezebel, uh, she's in favor of worshiping Baal, sometimes called Baal. Her husband Ahab is weak-minded. But Jezebel is very upset by what Elijah did in chapter 18, and she sends a message to him, I want to kill you. And Elijah feels it's not just Jezebel, but actually many Israelites also want to kill him, if you read the whole passage carefully. And he loses his nerve. He runs away. In fact, he goes from Carmel all the way down to Beersheba. This is the very southern part of the land of, of Israel. Then he dismisses his servant. Then he goes even further down. He goes to Horeb, to Sinai. Uh, and it's an amazing story. God comes to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? That's a question I think God asks me and you also. What are we doing here? And he said, oh, well, I've been very zealous or jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. By the way, jealous, zealous, that's basically the same word. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Okay. The Lord tells him, you remember this story? Go out and stand on the mountain. And the Lord passes by. This is very, it's parallel to the Lord passing by so Moses can see him. This is in Exodus 34. But here we are in 1 Kings 19. And first, there's a strong wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. Then there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And then a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a gentle whisper. So many people think that uh, if it's God, it must be. A hundred decibels loud, it must be uh, really uh, earth shattering. Someone could say, Yes, I was blown away. It was so good. Strong wind. Or that really rocked the earthquake. Or I'm fired up the fire. But you'll notice that this would be to misunderstand God. God is not necessarily speaking to us in those other ways. But then comes the sound of a gentle whisper. And the gentle whisper, well, it's the same message. What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, there's something there for us, because noise distracts us. And as I will often admit, there's a lot of noise even in my own head. A suggestion from a friend. To spend 15 minutes a day sitting with God. What does that mean? With no distractions. Well, how do you sit with no distractions? No devices no agenda, don't worry, it's fine just to be totally quiet. I mean, you don't even have to pray, but just be there in the presence of the Lord. Solitude, which is considered by thousands of holy men and women to be a fundamental spiritual discipline.
couple months ago, I read a whole book just on that one topic. I was very challenged. But there's one more area before uh, we transition to some interaction or some questions. And yes, it's the word death. Now you saying, what, this is a practical? Like you want us to die? What do you mean? What I mean is we are going to die. Let's die well. In previous centuries, there was more of an emphasis on dying well. I read, maybe at the beginning of the year, a book called, oh, I see it in my bookshelf, The Art of Dying Well. The Art of Dying Well. And you say, an art? Normally an artist has lots of practice. You only die once. But yes, but we need to die well. The things we should express before we die. There may be those with whom we must reconcile. There may be some achievements, things that I, that I want to accomplish before I die. And just being prepared, because we're not given advance information. Am I going to die instantaneously in a motor accident, or am I going to die in agony over 10 years of cancer? Eating my body? You don't know if this could be quick or slow. No, no one knows. So we need to be prepared. And this is something we should give a lot of thought to. I know, you're younger, you may say, oh, uh, I don't need to worry about that. You know, I'm only 30, I'm only 40. Oh, really? Like 30-year-olds don't die? 40-year-olds don't die? Uh, maybe you, you should write a will, and maybe you've not done that. You'll make it much easier on those uh, family and friends afterwards to know what your wishes were if they're written down. But these are just some thoughts on dying well. And so these are seven areas. Giving, praying, fasting, meditation, solitude, and death. I know, I didn't say reading, but I still think we should read. It's just that there's no biblical command. Well, my friends, these are some ideas about our relationship uh, in practical living, our relationship in the vertical direction, that is with God above. And uh, next week, we'll be talking about relationship with others, also seven areas, uh, on the horizontal. And then the week after that, our final week, um, I'll do my best to answer questions that you have in the area of practical Christian living. More about that later on. So with the minutes that remain, yes, we have time for questions. And so I'll stop uh, screen sharing and uh, Brian uh, will uh, take over and guide us during this period. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you for taking us through to the vertical relationship with God today of practical Christian living and the seven principles that you laid down. I'm sure a lot of questions are going to come through. Uh, just want to ask you a question on prayer. Uh, how do you react or respond to prayer that sounds more like a command or perhaps to say kind of an exorcism kind of a prayer, like a command thee to come out or things like that? You know, how do you, should we say amen to that? Um, I'll make sure I understood. Could, could you just say the question one more time for me? Sure. And I'm going to turn my yeah, volume sure. up so How I can hear better. How do you react? Or sure, sure. Can you all hear me clearly? Is yes, my connection I, yeah. okay? It was just me. All right, great. No, no, because I had some problem earlier on. So, anyways, so the question is, how do you react or respond to a prayer that sounds like more like a command? You mean someone, Commanding someone else God. is praying? Yes, somebody else is praying, right? How do I respond? Not very well. Do you, do you I mean, say like, amen to that? Do you say amen to that? Well, you can only say amen if you agree with, with what's being said. That's also why I don't say amen if someone's praying in another, another language unless I know that language. Um, it, yeah, some, some people use prayer as an opportunity for revenge or passive aggression or advertising. <laughs> and also, Lord, Help me find a buyer for my motorcycle that is on the market now, and I'm only asking this much. You know, it's we're not supposed to do that. Jesus, I think, in Matthew six, is saying, "Keep our prayers, ele uh, yeah, not I say elegantly streamlined, not elegant like flowery, but it's simple." And God knows what we need. There's no need to remind God of all the things that we need or to promote our own agenda. So yeah, I, I probably don't react very well when that happens. How about you? Yeah. yeah, something like, you know, people have prayers, like I declare this and I declare that and I command that in the name of Jesus. So prayer which goes oh, I see. That, that, that kind of fashion that was. 
so when someone says I command, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, that sounds like an exorcism, but how would mm. we, how would we command in prayer? I, I don't think that's the attitude. And we have, we have um, a couple hundred prayers in the Bible that we can look at. <laughs> Many of them are in the book of Psalms, mm. but we can look at those prayers and see if, if there's support for uh, commanding for, instead of being humble before God and receptive, you know, rather we're, we're trying to promote um, what we think is God's will. Um, yeah, so that's my response. Is that sufficient? Uh, kind of that, yes, kind of. Uh, I hope those listening. Uh, yeah, I wish I could do better then, because I'm not sure I've heard, um, I don't think I've heard prayers like that maybe in a long time. Um, yeah, it's, it's more of a charismatic, uh, I think, uh, background towards it. Yeah, and I think it's it's very powerful. It's it's about power. It's kind of like the, the name it and claim it theology. Lord, I know you have this blessing for me. My name is written on it. I claim it. In the name of Jesus, give it to me. And um, I think it's too willful. It's too, um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't recognize that as the spirit of Christ. I could be wrong, but the way to settle it is to look at the prayers of the Bible and look at the many prayers of the New Testament and see what the attitude is. Okay. okay. Thank you, Douglas. We'll move on to the next question. It says the Pope suggested that Matthew 6.13. The Pope suggested that Matthew 6.13. And lead us not in temptation should be revised because God cannot lead us into temptation. What do you think about that? I'm sorry, there was too much reverberation here. It's a question about Matthew 6.13. I heard that part. Let me just look at Matthew 6.13 and you can make... Could you say it again, um, maybe more slowly? Yeah, sure. The Pope suggested that Matthew 6.13 says, and lead us not into temptation. Yeah. To be revised because God cannot lead us into temptation. Oh. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I think that's probably being too picky. I mean, indirectly, God guides us. He's our shepherd. We're the sheep. We follow, and sometimes we follow in some scary places. Uh, but more directly, God is not tempted by evil, nor can he tempt anyone. So when he, I think when Jesus says, we, we pray, lead us out of temptation, he's not... He's not um, He's not asking God to do something that God would, wouldn't do anyway, because that would be rather empty, inane. Uh, you know, that's like you know, praying, and God, please be righteous. I mean, God is righteous. Uh, so I think he's talking about the challenging circumstances of our lives in which we may be tempted. You see, sometimes the question is very precise and technical, more so than the passage. And the Bible is not written the way a philosopher or a theologian would write a book. It's not written tightly, uh, everything logical, consistent, accurate, compact. It's more loose, more like an old shoe that fits well and is very comfortable, though I don't want your old shoe, thank you. Uh, I'll use my own. But the Bible is its more like that. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question, Douglas. It says, can reading and meditating go hand in hand? Else like the king who leads his kingdom, oh, yes. the person who leads his life can also be derailed. Yes, I think that's sure. They go hand in hand. And, you know, if possible, we want to be in that kind of reflective, meditative, receptive attitude as we read God's word. So yes, they can go together. Now, the truth is, some days it's, it's just hard to, it's hard for the word to penetrate because we've got anxiety. We, we, maybe we have limited time. You know, these are principles that, that it would not be good. Okay, now we're going to use Douglas's seven laws and we'll ask everyone, how are you doing today? Only three out of seven. No, that's the opposite of what, what I'm trying to do. I, I, I'm trying to help us to be, to, to be free, to understand the principles, we don't need another law. We don't need a checklist. Uh, but yeah, but often uh, the word and meditation go together just as prayer. We can pray and 
a meditative way. But prayer doesn't always have to have words or be loud. Uh, we can be in God's presence, even if we're not saying anything. Just be receptive. Just as you could sit next to your wife uh, and not talk, not because you had an argument, but sometimes you don't need to talk. It's just nice to be together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Based on meditation, uh, since we're talking on meditation, you know, you shared about John Joshua 1.8, that meditation mm. is connected with being strong and connected. Could you mm. elaborate a bit on that? that was... Well, yeah, Joshua, is, in this situation, Joshua is commissioned by Moses to now lead the people, um, the crossing into the promised land. Uh, and it's, it's scary to, to be a, a leader, uh, to set an example. This is not easy. And so he, it's kind of like, it's like Deuteronomy 17. The higher up you are, the more important it is that you really have God's word in your life. So Joshua is to meditate on the words of the law. And uh, you, you may remember that in that chapter, Joshua 1, several times we see that phrase, strong and courageous. So just being strong and courageous on our own. Okay, I'm going to hyperventilate. Uh, maybe I can have another cup of coffee. Okay, now this is, that should not be the source of the courage. Courage shouldn't come from a cup or, or a bottle. The courage comes from understanding God's will. It, the courage comes from understanding what he wants. And that is often not what others want, even God's own people. Sometimes even leaders of God's people may be going in the wrong direction. So we've got to realize this is, it's, you know, I'm, I need to be authentic and courageous, not rude and argumentative, but to be strong and courageous, to have the strength of convictions founded on the word of God, not convictions that, uh, yeah, maybe there's some scriptures that sort of support it, but you can't really prove it. Like every day at 5 p.m., I need to invite somebody to church. Okay, where is that in the Bible? <laughs> I mean, maybe that's good for you for now, but, uh, you know, making up laws, the danger is that if we do that, people will say, yes, I, I need that. Thank you. And now there we go. We're taking people away from the word and the principles of the word into a, a humanistic way of measuring progress and maturity. And the only way to really know that we're maturing is to see is our character becoming more like that of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Romans 12, Romans 8, um, many other passages. Okay? Thank you, Douglas, for that. Uh, there's a question not related to today's uh, lesson as such, but I guess uh, people are wanting some answers. Uh, it's related to, please, he says, please enlighten us about 144,000 souls being saved. In I'm, so, I'm so sorry. It's the reverberation. You have to speak more slowly. I can't hear the words. <laughs> sorry, Douglas. Uh, the clear... que not, yeah, the question part is what I couldn't hear. Okay. Go ahead. So this is not related to today's lesson, though. Yes, I heard that part. The question Could itself. Please enlighten us about the 144,000 souls being saved in Revelation. Oh, yes. The multitude. Is the multitude souls and the 144,000 souls the same? So if I, it's hard to hear, but you're asking if the 144,000 is the great multitude? Yes. No. Well, of course, it's not a literal number. It's symbolic, like almost all of Revelation. But in Revelation, there's an image of a, of a, a great multitude on earth and a small multitude in heaven. So the small multitude, again, it's not literal. It's 12,000 people from uh, 12 tribes of Israel and they're all virgin males. So if it's literal, then there are no women in heaven. You have to be Jewish. If you're married, probably no luck for you. Sorry, it's only virgin Jewish men. This is symbolic. On the earth, that's where you see this multitude from every tribe and language. and No one can count it. And probably we shouldn't try to count it. <laughs> but if you're being a good Bible interpreter or a a more accurate Jehovah's Witness, you would say, no, 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 the, the, the 144,000, that's a small number. There's a big number on the earth. But they teach, that group teaches that, that those 144,000 slots have all been filled now. So, but you can still be saved. You just can't be in that group. 
But that is quite, um, yeah, that, that, that ties in a little bit more to last week's uh, presentation. So maybe there's some more questions or, uh, on, um, on our relationship, practical living, our relationship with God. And I think we're doing well on time. Yeah, I think we're doing very well on time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the next question, Douglas, is praying in the spirit. What does it really mean? Praying, praying in, the in the spirit. Yeah, so praying in the spirit is a, a, a phrase that appears a couple of times in the New Testament, like Jude, I think is Jude 21. Um, now, the problem with this kind of gets back to the charismatic movement. A lot of them think that praying in the spirit means you're praying in some angelic language, which I, I think is impossible anyway. It's, it's a misunderstanding of First Corinthians. But the thing is, we're all commanded to pray in the spirit. So if praying in the spirit means you have to have a gift of tongues, which Paul said only some people would have, well, then it's a command that most people cannot obey. So that cannot be right. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul makes a distinction between praying with our mind. Um, uh, uh, he, he speaks of fruitfulness, of the mind being fruitful or not being fruitful. He seems to be saying that we should, it's not good to have an unfruitful mind. That when we pray, yeah, we should know what we're praying and, and not just be weird and, and what's the word? Uh, uh, I know, just mysterious. You don't really know what it is. Uh, so in Jude, we're all we're all supposed to pray in the spirit. And I think the answer is really simple. I think he means to pray spiritually. What you mean to pray in the spirit? Yeah, to pray spiritually with the with the mind of Christ. Uh, to pray not for ourselves, but to pray more like the Lord's prayer, we're concerned with God's glory and His kingdom. And yes, we know he'll take care of us, but we understand that that day by day sustenance uh, is it's more than just bread. It's directly connected with how we treat others, those who are who wrong us or who owe us money, that we need to be forgiving. And uh, we really need God with us if, if we're not gonna, going to get into a bad place. Uh, so I would say praying in the Spirit is uh, praying with the kinds of attitudes that Jesus encourages in prayer. So we looked at Matthew 6. I referred to the parable in Luke 18, but there are other places too. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, coming down to uh, the principle of giving, would tithing and contribution be part of giving? And what do you have to say about uh, your stand about the 10%? Well, yeah, I mean, my... What I say about this is what I've said the last 30 years, and it's all public. Uh, tithing is only for the Old Testament. And, of course, in the Old Testament times, most people didn't tithe because to tithe, you had to have animals or you had to have crops. It was 10% of your crops or 10% of your herds. Uh, and, and that part, early in the Old Testament, you know, at that time, the world didn't even really use money. That, that's not... That's more of a, it's not that they didn't have silver and gold, but what, the money, the way we think of it, that's more like 500 BC. You know, that, that's after the, well after the time of Moses. Uh, so in the Old Testament, we have to watch out for false comparisons. In the Old Testament, there was a requirement for everyone to give, um, there needed to be support for the Levites. They were the priestly tribe, and some of them only worked uh, two weeks a year. Others were in Jerusalem all the time. There was a, a need to support them, also to support the temple. But see, this was, Israel was an actual nation. It was a commonwealth. The church is no such thing. Uh, in the New Testament, although many denominations say you should tithe, technically that means gives 10% of, of your crops and, and herds, although most pastors will say it's 10% of your money, <laughs> Almost no churches actually do it, by the way. <laughs> but I, I th I'm against that because uh, the New Testament never says that there's a maximum or a minimum. And if you make up a law, you will. Some people will get off too easy, and others will be hurt by it. The Bible, the New Testament, simply does not say. Not a single passage. And don't talk about Matthew 23 because that's still the Old Testament when Jesus speaks about giving one tenth of the garden herbs. 
this is still under the law of Moses. The law of Moses no longer applies. Now, um, what do we give? Of course, I'm not going to tell you what I give because then I'll lose my reward in heaven. Uh, but uh, I do know that in Western culture, if we manage our budgets well, if we're wise and careful uh, and we're not in debt, then, you know, giving 5, 10, 20, 30 percent of our income is no problem at all. No problem at all. But I would not make a law for others. And I don't use the word tithe because tithe means give 10 percent. And that is not uh, something the early church did. And as I said, most of their money went to support the needy of the church. So it's not, the thing is most denominations today, they say give the tithe, but what's it for? It's for programs and staff and buildings. It's not the stuff that was emphasized in the New Testament. And maybe if we cared even more about the needy among us and out there, well, maybe we would really start to grow fast again. You know, that, that could be. So whoever you are who asked that question, you're not the only one. Uh, yeah, look, look at what I've written. Um, see what you think. Um, I, yeah, don't stop giving to your local church, whatever the needs are. <laughs> and definitely don't say it's okay because Douglas said it's okay to stop giving. You decide what you give to. That's not my decision. Uh, we, we, give to, uh, we give to the church. We give to Hope Worldwide. We give to organizations we trust. And that's our business. I'm not going to tell you how much. Wait, so you okay. call the New Testament tithing as giving or contribution and not just tithing. I'm sorry, say it again. I said, so, so you would say that in the New Testament or for us now, we wouldn't want to use the word tithing, but we would use the word giving or contributing. Well, with our culture, we have to call it something. Uh, I'm just saying in the New Testament itself, if you talked about your giving, I don't think they would know what you meant. You know, there were needs in the church, like in Acts 4, and particularly those who were better off liquidated assets and needs were met. You know, but to have a full-blown doctrine that everyone must give a certain amount, I just don't see that in the Bible. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think most of us should probably give. I know some of you listening to me, you're trying to support yourselves and you're also trying to help family in other parts of Asia. And right, I'm not in that position. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm here in, in the UK. My brother lives in Florida. Yeah, I need to send him money so he can survive in the United States. I mean, come on. It, it's so easy to make false comparisons. And for some people, uh, only using 10% of their income to help the poor and other needs, they should be ashamed of themselves for such a small uh, level of giving. For other people, to give 2% is heroic and commendable because of other responsibilities. But you just cannot make a system. In the Old Testament, it was a more systematized, but everyone was together. The people of God were a political unit uh, that itself had a budget. And so you'll find lots of verses in the New Testament things are much more flexible. Is that, is that good enough, Brian? Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Uh, I think we're running out of time. We just got a couple of more minutes. I think we'll just take two more questions. There's one on fasting, you know. Uh, it's abstaining from certain food, yet eating your fill count towards fasting. It's a question concerning fasting. And just say it more slowly, please. Sure. I just hear the echo. Of the... Sorry abstaining from certain foods and yet it eating your fill for the day, can it be count towards fasting? Eating your Let's what? Let's say abstain from eating meat. I don't eat meat. Oh, oh I, I see. Veggies instead. Well, yeah. Uh, being willing to break our routine or sacrifice to give something up, I think that generally that's a good thing. But, and to become a vegetarian for some of us, that's easy. For some of us, that's a big, that's very challenging. <laughs> a couple of years ago in Atlanta, the leaders challenged the church to uh, fast in some way, but they meant any way you want uh, for, what was it? They said three weeks, um, whatever the period of time was. 
and some people were fasting from chocolate and, you know, fasting from television or, <laughs> I mean, yes, because these things can control our lives and they shouldn't. Uh, so some of the fasting I think was very good. Some of it was probably made no difference at all. Uh, my wife and I thought, let's actually give up meat, but let's not do it for a few weeks. Let's give it up for six months and see what happens. You know what? It was okay. But don't ask me, are you still a vegetarian? And do you require other people to do it? Or is this what you recommend for spirituality? Because I'm not going to tell you today. But we can be creative in giving things up. I think that's, that's good. So I, I wouldn't say the Bible forbids all forms of sacrifice unless they're specifically spelled out in the area of fasting or giving money. But I would say that the goal is to have a, a genuine relationship with God. And as we'll see next week, a loving relationship with others. And we don't get that kind of authenticity when it just comes down to rules and, and checklists. So fasting, I'm just telling you, I, I suspect that fasting in biblical times uh, was more like the kind of fasting you'll find in Southwest Asia uh, throughout the centuries, uh, more like a daytime fast. So uh, you could do that, you know. Um, you can really do what you want. The Bible simply doesn't say that in a fast, you must never drink water, right? But it does say when you're deciding what to eat or drink, vegetable or meat, that you should do it to the glory of God, not cause other people to stumble, not judge them by your decisions, not judge someone else's servant because that brother or sister is a servant of God. Uh, do what is what works towards mutual encouragement, mutual edification. The kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink, but it's of joy and love and, you know, in the Holy Spirit. You know the passage I'm talking about. So now I've used up my time and yours. Hopefully um, uh, this was helpful. And we will continue talking about practical living next week. And, and then at the end of next week's talk, I will be soliciting specific questions uh, through which I will construct the seventh and final lesson. And I'll explain more of my thinking on that to you. And, and of course, uh, uh, Jacob and I will be discussing this in the next few days. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, and uh, Pong, and I guess it's soon Basam is going to take over. So thank you.